Good morning. Good morning to those that are joining us online as well. Today we're continuing in our eight passages that led Jesus' ministry. Old Testament uh, prophecies that Jesus either spoke of as fulfilled in him or that would be fulfilled in the work and the lives of others. So we've been taking a look at these and we started in Isaiah chapter 61 where today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. It informed him of his message and his ministry. He was the carrier of the gospel of deliverance and compassion. Then we looked at Isaiah chapter 53, informed him of the need for suffering and service as the suffering Messiah, the promised one. That passage helped him understand that. Psalm 118 spoke of the truth of rejection and the acceptance as the cornerstone and the stumbling stone. Some people would accept and some people would reject. That passage, Psalm 118, gets repeated a number of times. So today we're looking at the ministry of a prophet that lived about 800 years before Jesus who spoke a powerful sermon. Some of you are really going to like this. A powerful sermon of eight words. Huh? Just eight words. Eight words of condemnation, though. And those eight words of condemnation led to the repentance of a major city. So let's get right to the text. The text is Jonah. We're going to take a look at Jonah chapter 3. I read Jonah chapter 2, the prayer of Jonah from inside the big fish. In Jonah chapter 3, we have this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So what happened the first time? It led to him going the opposite direction. Storm comes, gets, he says, it was me, chucked me off the boat. God saves him with the big fish. He spends three days and nights in the inside of a fish, gets spit up on shore in the direction that he was supposed to be going, and then he's got to walk quite a ways to go do the ministry. So, the summary. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You like how that's nice and succinct? Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Did you get that as part of the story? It is the capital city of the Assyrians. The Assyrians are the people that took the ten tribes of the north. And they are known for being mean. Very, very mean. So because of their historical connection, Jonah probably wanted to be a prophet, but just don't send me to them. Send me to the Israelites. Send me to my own people. Send me to anybody but the Ninevites. And God says, you want to go where? I'll send you to the Ninevites, the capital city, the capital city of, of the Assyrians. Jonah doesn't want to go. But it does say in verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. I got a little question here about proclaim to it the message I give you. But he did go to the city. Now is this the full message that God wanted him to give or did he just give the short form? Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. So picture that size of city. If you were walking all day, three days to get through one city. It's a big place. Capital city. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, here's your eight-word sermon, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. See that gospel of message of hope, deliverance, the grace of God, purpose of the kingdom? What's he go into the city and say? You're all in trouble. And 40 days. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Starts walking, starts talking. Delivering this message as he goes. Well, problem was God was already there and working among them and they were ready to repent. Jonah doesn't like that. But verse 5 says the Ninevites believed God. Not Jonah. They attest it to God. 
A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. This is from the king. The message goes through the city, gets to the king, and he's like, we got to get straight. Straighten up. Everybody, time for a fast. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Now, because we get the word God on there. So Jonah is speaking to the Ninevites, but the record of the encounter is for the Israelites. So Jonah uses Hebrew. Remember the book of Daniel? Daniel uses Babylonian language. It's a Babylonian record of what's going on. So the word that Jonah has in here, that God has in here, is Elohim, a plural noun that's most commonly used in the Hebrew Bible to refer to one true God, emphasizing majesty and power. So his record, back to the Israelites, is that they called on God, the one true God, with all majesty and power. The follow-up is, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with his compassion, turn from his fierce anger, so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. It was only an eight-word sermon and he got a bunch of it wrong. Because they listened and they repented. It's a short sermon, but a huge response. It all sounds pretty good, but that's not the section of the story that Jesus mentions. Not the section that he mentions first from one of the prophets that spent, in spent that time inside a big fish. The section that Jesus fulfills and connects to is more about being rejected as the Messiah than it is about being received. So the Israelites know the story of Jonah. They're raised with it. It has an 800-year history with them. And they're raised with it. The very last part of Jonah says, shouldn't God have compassion on anyone and everyone? Why are you so upset that people repent? The message is about God's deliverances for all nations, even Assyrian Ninevites. And don't get mad when, people, when God accepts people. And it's a message that they struggle with over and over and over. And so when Jesus is speaking here in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, it's where we're going next, he mentions the story of Jonah. And it comes within this context. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, 38 to 45. If you're using one of the guest Bibles, it's page 1,516. Jesus connects to the fulfillment of part of the message of Jonah. That teaching is also in Luke chapter 11, if you want to look at the parallels there as well. So starting at verse 38... It says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Who asked for it? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Do you already suspect that there may be ulterior motive to that question? Do you think that Jesus kind of knows what's coming up? That this isn't a, hey, could you just help us out? This is more, you want to fight? How could we catch you into something? Prove that you're wrong? So this is where I would expect to see a phrase like, and Jesus knew what was in their hearts. <laughs> Don't you kind of... Uh, them? And Jesus knew what was in their hearts, and so he says the following. That idea comes up in John 2, 24, and Luke 16, 15, Matthew 9, 4. He says, and he knew what they were thinking. So I think the, the idea of it still fits here. He knows why they're asking and what they're really asking. 
His answer suggests that Jesus knew what they asked and why they asked it. So in verse 39, he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. Oops. Immediately turns it over and says, I know what you're doing. You want a sign, but you don't plan on following through. Your hearts are not right. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So here's the sign that they're going to get. The sign that Jesus is who he says he is. That he promised what he said he would promise. That he followed through. That he is the Messiah that he claims to be. The sign is the sign of Jonah. But what part of Jonah? For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Amen. Amen. Not now in Matthew 12, but we'll get to it. The sign that you're looking for, whether Jesus is who he says he is, is going to be the tomb. He will be dead, placed in the tomb, but he will not stay there. Just like Jonah went into the fish and came back out, the sign is the resurrection. See how Jesus is already leading to that in chapter 12? But if you're wicked and adulterous and you don't believe who Jesus is, even if he's raised from the dead, will you still just not believe? Did everybody believe after Jesus came out of the tomb? No. 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 So even given that major sign, it doesn't matter if your heart's not ready to receive it. If you want to argue with it, you can argue away the evidence. But he says, here's the sign that I will provide. But you have to look at it in faith. So it's the point that he'll come back to and focus on in a bit. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the defining sign that Jesus is the Messiah and our Savior, right? But the passage is in Matthew 12. We've not developed much of that theme yet. So he doesn't say, I'm going to die, be buried, and raised again. He says, here's the sign. It's going to be like Jonah, who was inside and then outside. But then he flips it over to what we just read. Why aren't they going to believe? Why don't they repent? Why doesn't everybody just look at the same evidence and say, of course, God is God. Jesus is Jesus. He's the one that can save us. Well, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. So the wicked people of Nineveh heard a message and repented. How long was that sermon? It was eight words and it was all about condemnation. But they were ready to receive the message and wanted to be right with God. So the length of the message or who even brought it or the motive of who brought it didn't really matter in the sense that they were seeking God and they took the steps that they took. But Jesus... Jesus has given the Pharisees and the Israelites the invitation of the full gospel message. His was much longer than eight words. They could look at his life. They could see how he taught people, how he led people. Matthew 12 is after the Sermon on the Mount and the impact of that. If they were looking to see if Jesus really is who he is, there's plenty enough evidence. But if you're looking to disprove or to argue, nothing's going to convince you. And so he says, well, guess what? The people of Nineveh can judge you and say, it's better to repent. In verse 42, another example. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. So, good question, Susan. First Kings chapter 20. 10 verse 1. It's an account of the, the Queen of Sheba. 
finds out that Solomon is presenting wisdom and she's like, well, then what am I doing here? So she makes the journey to come to Solomon to learn some things. She made an effort. Now, the wisdom of Solomon is a lot of wisdom, but who is more wise, Solomon or Jesus? And if you had the opportunity to speak to Jesus and to learn from Jesus, would you? I hope so. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law don't. They have the opportunity to learn from him, but what they do is they stand there and they argue. And they convince the nation, that generation, to reject Jesus. And so like in any good court case, now we got two witnesses. If you follow the way of the Ninevites, you have enough information, and they can say, you should have repented. You should have repented. There was enough evidence. And the Queen of the South, Queen of Sheba, says, you had access to wisdom and you didn't do it. You're at fault. You put yourself where you are. Your judgment is right. And then we get another section talking about what happens if you just change a little bit. And this is a powerful section as well. The last image ups the stakes as it speaks of having an evil spirit or an unclean spirit removed. So I, I know enough about God to be better, but I haven't actually replaced it with God. So it says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house, what's the word? Unoccupied. The bad thing has been removed, but what did you not do? Replace it with anything good. You've left that space unoccupied. In your mind, in your heart, spiritually, relationally, socially, sexually, ethically, financially. You've done, I'm no longer doing the bad, but I haven't put in the good. And so the spirit that left comes back and it says, huh, it's open and you've cleaned it up. Finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. So it says, I'll respect that and I'll stay away. Does it? Does the bad spirit say, you know what? Good effort. Nope. It goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That's how it will be with the wicked generation. Because they have to decide who Jesus is. Is he the Messiah? Is he fulfilling all of these prophecies? And if they look at Jesus and say, He's a pretty good teacher. I'll accept him as that. Well, they've opened themselves up to a different way of thinking. They've opened themselves up to a bigger deceit. If they do not connect to Jesus as Messiah, they are worse off than at the beginning because they think they're okay now. But they don't really have that connection to Jesus that they could and that they should. The end section warns that generation if they make some changes to be more focused on God but to reject Jesus as Messiah, they'll be in a worse place than they were when they weren't seeking God. The warning can be true for us today if we make moves to be more spiritual, to be more good, to be more changed, to be better, to be healthier, to be a little more religious but we don't honor the sign of Jesus that Jesus died and was in the grave three days before his resurrection. If Jesus isn't the one that moves in and makes the change in all of us, yes, yeah, some of these are pre-repentance. They're about getting our heart ready. They're about opening ourselves up to Jesus. But if you do that and don't add Jesus, you still haven't really made the change. His life, death, burial, and resurrection are proven in the empty tomb. That leads us to die to our old life, to be buried with him in water, in baptism, and to rise to a new life in Christ, 
with Jesus our Lord and Master. That's the step that has to also happen. Not just to be a little more religious, to be a little better, to be a little healthier. Because then you can confuse or delude yourself into thinking you're okay with God. Eternally. But that requires Jesus as Lord and Master. And that's what happens when we make that connection. So thinking about coming to Jesus as Lord is not enough. Just like my image here of the bridge. It got started. But what happens? It'll only get you so far. The follow through is following through. You got to make the connection. You got to get there. Reach out. And Jesus will reach out and make sure that the connection is there. It's what he wants for all of us. Thinking about coming to Jesus as Lord is not enough. The commitment needs to follow through or we'll be in a worse state at the end of time as we talked about in class today. Because I almost accepted Jesus. But now you get the guilt of knowing you almost did. Satan will use against you for eternity. We're here to help one another come to know Jesus and live for him. We're glad to help you wherever at you're in, you are at in your journey. We're excited to see people come to him and make that change and exchange in baptism. But it's about the journey of coming and removing the old and adding the new. But Jesus is who we're adding in. Jesus uses Jonah's story to foreshadow his death and resurrection as a powerful sign of God's love and redemption. Just as Jonah called Nineveh to repentance, Jesus calls us to turn from sin and his resurrection empowers us to live transformed lives, free from the chains and the guilt of sin. Jonah didn't know he was talking about repentance. He just wanted condemnation. But the Ninevites said, this means change, repentance. And so that's how they heard the message and how they followed through. Jesus says this means deliverance. One leads to another. It's the 1st of December. Happy birthday to Rick. And many people will decorate with a manger or talk about Jesus as the baby in the manger. But we're starting our discussion at the empty tomb. Because Jesus knew that the cradle led to the cross. And that the cross leads to the crown. So we share that message of hope, of joy, and of celebration. Jonah exited the fish and shared a message of condemnation. Jesus exited the womb and the tomb to share a message of repentance and grace. So we're thankful for the truth and the impact of the Christmas and Easter message. The resurrection message is the sign of Jonah. I will be in the tomb, in the grave for three days, but I will come out. And that makes all the difference. If they connect to that message in Matthew 12, if they start looking for that, they will be ready for when it happens later. And they will get to spend eternity with God. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So what's the so what and the what now? It's thinking about questions like, how does the birth and resurrection of Jesus impact your life and your purpose? How does the Christmas and Easter message, Christmas and resurrection, how does that center who you are as an individual and why you exist and why you get up and why you do what you do? Because they're both true. With whom and how can you take the conversation about the birth and resurrection further? Who do you know that knows the story but they haven't made the commitment? Well, how do you take that conversation further? If he came in the manger, what was his purpose? If he got out of the tomb, then what difference does it make? How do you have that conversation with somebody? Who do you think is at that stage of taking that conversation further? And if you're close to deciding about committing to Jesus in baptism and leading a new life, how can we help you take those last steps? How can we help make sure that you make that connection? Because thinking about it is a good step 
but there comes the time to make the connection. And that's what Jesus offers. Don't wait and don't time out, but make a decision wisely. And we're here to help with that discussion. The sign of Jonah still exists. There is, there was, and is, and will be an empty tomb. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference spiritually. <coughs> Jesus said that that would be fulfilled. The sign of Jonah was fulfilled in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How we take that message and to whom we share that message is the challenge that we take up this week. Next week, one of your favorite Old Testament books, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. You know what? When you beat the shepherd, the sheep will run. That's what Jesus says. Also true at the cross. How many people stuck around with him? How many people went through it? And he says, I already knew. Because scripture led his life. And Jesus was forewarned and foreknew so many things because he knew God's word. That's why we stay in it today. We want to know it in context. Thank you for your time and attention. Let's continue to worship together.